All right, so today um, we're going to continue on with the pre-Socratic philosophers, and we'll go on to uh, one named Parmenides, as you see here on the slide. So just to review, to put Parmenides in context, we'll kind of sh briefly review what we said before about Heraclitus. So remember Heraclitus, um, going along with the premise that or the, let's say the project of looking for the one that is many and the what stays the same in the midst of changes, right? Uh, that's based on the two problems that we started out explaining, the problem of the one and many and the problem of permanence and change. Heraclitus concludes that everything is fire. We can understand that in terms of the conversation that was going on in Miletus earlier uh, over what th what is everything or looking for the element or the stuff that everything is sort of made of, right, or consists of. Um, but Heraclitus is a little bit different here, right, because what he means by fire is, in essence, that there are not really things actually at all but rather uh, a process. You could say processes, but it would seem like all being is sort of one process, and it's um, not clear really whether he's saying that that's one thing that is at the same time many things, or, you know, it's certainly, it's the case that he's not, he's saying that nothing really is permanent in the sense that uh, we think uh, is the case when we uh, conceive ourselves as observing things in change, right, um, or things that are changing. He doesn't really think there's a really a stable thing that is undergoing the change, but he does allude to the measures, right, uh, the idea of a, a form or kind of order to change, which... Um, in virtue of which it's not purely chaotic, but it's a process rather than simply random chaotic change, right? And so we can basically understand Heraclitus is telling us that reality is, is a process, being is a process rather than a, than a thing. Hmm. But it does lead to a lot of um, questions about what the most plausible way of understanding that is, what the correct way of understanding that is and whether it does uh, sort of correspond to the way things really are, right? Uh, but it's in that case uh, that it's, it's, in, it's in contrast to him, or let's say in comparison or juxtaposition to Heraclitus, that we can understand Parmenides. Parmenides is maybe, maybe more difficult to understand than Heraclitus even. Um, and we might say that Parmenides is possibly the opposite of Heraclitus. Yeah, because we could, and a normal way to understand Heraclitus is to say that Heraclitus is now denying the one, right, in favor of many, and denying permanence in favor of change, right? So there's just all these happenings that are happening. There's not even anything that's, that things are happening to because there are no things. And whether or not he's denying the one in favor of the many is sort of unclear, but let's just say and understand or characterize him rather as being citing on that, right? There is no such thing as, as oneness and there's no such thing as permanence. But what really exists is change and multiplicity, right? Um, <clears throat> so Parmenides can be understood as the diametric opposite of that view because Parmenides here is claiming that everything is one and does not change, right? Um, so we have a very interesting and sort of, you know, it seems impossible proposition because what we actually experience in the world are many things and we do experience things changing. And we could think that Heraclitus is sort of siding with the evidence of our senses, right? Um, he's telling us, look, you know, I mean, what we do observe is change, right? We think there are things, but we don't observe things because everything we observe is constantly sort of flowing, right? It's constantly in the flux, in a process of changing. 
And so we can understand Heraclitus perhaps is siding with the evidence of the senses uh, over the evidence of reason and logic in case in this case where they seem to be in contradiction with each other right um why though would reason and logic seem to be on the side of oneness and permanence rather than change and multiplicity that we experience well here's the argument that we will see from parmenides yeah um so we see here the first premise says what is is and the second premise says what is not is not right um, and those are often considered in classical logic to be you know, basic principles of logic right if you don't dis differentiate and distinguish between being and non-being right between uh, is and is not <laughs> right then nothing that you say could have any meaning, right? Because, you know, that's, that's if, if, if there's not a monkey in the room, then it cannot be the case that there is a monkey in the room, right? And vice versa. So, you know, the idea here is that every proposition is either true or false. And, and the way that uh, Parmenides conceives it, you know, and the way it's normally conceived in this context, whether something is true or false has to do with what is you know, existing or not existing, yeah? The statement there's a monkey in the room is true if, in fact, uh, there is a monkey being there, right? And if there's no monkey being there, then uh, it's not true that there's a monkey in the room. So if we thought that it could be the case that there could be a monkey in the room and not a monkey in the room, then any it would be impossible to think anything, right? Because the truth of anything would not necessarily entail the falsehood of its opposite and vice versa. Nothing would make any sense at all. Uh, it seems to follow there would no, not be anything, right? So we take that, right? What is, is. What is not, is not. And another way to understand that is to say that nothing is not something. Nothing is not a thing, right? So this, you may recall, uh, this may make you recall the in class when we discussed a little bit about the classical Islamic theological debate over the ayat in Surah Yasin, where uh, it says that when Allah decrees or wills a thing, he says to it, be and it is. And they asked the question about, you know, whether uh, that means that there's a thing before it exists and that God commanded to exist and then after that it, it, it exists. Uh, so that it seems like there would be non-existent things, right? And the question was whether to understand that literally or figuratively. Because if we understood it literally, uh, the concern was that would entail that there are non-existent things, and then we wonder what that means. How can something be something and at the same time non-existent? Well, Parmenides taking this view here, and that uh, something cannot be something and yet not existent because if it were not existent it would be nothing and to be nothing is you know the opposite of being something right uh, nothing or when we say that something is not it's not as if we're we're, we're, we're we're actually describing it the way we would describe an existing thing if we say for example the apple is red right um, then we would be describing the apple as an existing thing in a certain condition or in a certain state, right? So non-existence is not a state of a thing. It's just the complete absence of the thing. Mm -hmm. That's his point here. Uh, when he's now distinguishing strictly between these two positions, that being and non-being are mutually exclusive, and there is no way that something can both be and not to be All right um, now the problem is uh, a change he says is for a thing to become something it's not right and and that goes back to really this uh, the, the the central insight you know or the central idea uh, that I tried to explain with the again the story about you know the 
hypothetical story about your friend getting turned into a frog by a witch and the question whether it's your friend who's now a frog or whether it's actually just your friend doesn't exist anymore and the frog only a frog is there yeah uh so take this example that you know a baby boy changes into a man if if he really changes into a man then his mother could say when you know for example looking at an old picture of him this is the baby i used to sing to sleep and then the father can say yes but he's not that baby anymore right so and this is because right the you know if if it re i mean if if he really grew and if it's the same person or the same being that actually went and un undergone this change um then those both have to be true i mean he both is that baby and he's not that baby right and so that means that you know what is would be what is not and what is not would be what is which parmenides says is a contradiction it can't be possible yeah um so right it's impossible that he is the baby and he's not the baby it can only be one or the other and so therefore for parmenides nothing can change into something else that it is not yeah so we might say well experience shows us i mean that he really is that baby right i mean he has memories perhaps that he could refer to as evidence right that he's the same being and having undergone these changes if that's the case and if that is you know evidence from observation or the senses then we have right now a contradiction yeah because it does seem like logic tells us that something cannot both be and not be he cannot both be the baby and not be the baby right so uh you know we have to decide whether it's the case that logic is wrong and reason is wrong and something can both be and not be right or whether uh the senses are deceiving us right and the appearance of change is merely an appearance and not the reality right mm. that looks like what the situation is from parmenides perspective and so parmenides opts for siding with the what what reason what reason tells us right okay so uh here's the argument in a nutshell i guess so we can look at the uh try to put it in you know this is not how of course parmenides wrote it in his writing parmenides wrote a long and sort of mystical sounding poem where a deity comes and you know in a dream or a vision and talks to him and bestows on him this sort of wisdom and things you know it's kind of hard to decipher when you when you really boil it down you try to get to his argument this is something like you get something like this right so if we were to put it in a form that is clear as possible and makes as much sense as possible it could be like this maybe it could be done better <laughs> right but this is my attempt what is is and what is not is not if there is change then what is is not and what is not is for a thing to change it and then the reasons for thinking that as we had just said for a thing to change it has to be one thing at an earlier time and a different thing at a later time so for a thing to change it has to be this same thing at both times right so both of those have to be true but both of them cannot be true right um if the baby is not the grown man then it can't be that he grew from a baby and now he's an old man because it's not the same he in either case right um uh and for a thing to change it has to be this same thing at both times yeah so therefore if there's change then what is is not am um, sorry then what is is not and what is not is yeah therefore change is impossible okay so there's something like an argument there or there's some some uh version of his argument formalized to see the structure it seems like if the premises are true the conclusion would have to be true but the question then is whether the premises are all true right um well not really there's a missing premise and that is that it's impossible for something well i guess that's in the first right 
refers to what is is and what is not is not. If we're going to take that to mean that it's impossible for it to be otherwise, yes, we have a valid argument. Roughly, yeah. You can look at it, and 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 uh, you um, uh, evaluate it for yourself. If it's valid, then when we have to look for you know or ask which premise is false, right? And that sort of helps to guide us in, in our reflection. Okay. Assuming that I got this right, yeah? <laughs> so, that was his argument that change is impossible, yeah? And now we have an argument that uh, there is only one thing and there cannot be many things. And essentially, it, you know, it comes down to the same thing. Now, Parmenides is going to tell us that for something to, for there to be many things, then something is what, what it's not. Yeah, but this is a little bit more complicated. So let's look at this step by step here. If there are two things, let's call them thing A and thing B, or thing one and thing two, like in the Dr. Seuss book. Yeah, you could do that. Or you can just call them thing A and thing B and imagine them as funny sort of cartoon uh, Dr. Seuss type creatures. Right? So if there are two things, A and B, then A must be separate from B. Right? They must not be uh, the same. They must be separated in some way or another. So A and B are either separated by nothing or they are separated by something. Yeah? If they are separated by nothing, then they are not actually separated. Because nothing separates them. So if they are separated by nothing, then they are actually one thing and they're not different. Okay? But if they were separated by something, which, according to the argument, they must be separated by something if they are, in fact, separated, because for them to be separated by nothing just means that they're not separated. Yeah? If they are separated by something, then the thing that separates them must be a third thing, C, which is different from either thing 1 or thing B. Yeah? And if there is this third thing and it's separate, it must be separated from both A and B, either by nothing or by something, yeah? So it follows, right? You can see how that's going to follow that if A and B are separated by something, then an infinite regress, an infinite, sorry, an infinite regress of things would be required to separate them, right? Because if C were separated from A and B, then there must be, I guess, two more things, right? Which are the something which separates C from both A and B. And then there must be more things that separate those things from everything else. And we end up with an infinite regress of things. Separators, right? So therefore, A and B are not separated by something because, right, the, well, we, we're... Premise 9 here tells us that an infinite regress of such things is impossible. Yeah? Um, and one might sort of ask why that is the case, but at least we can just leave it right here and, and, and consider that the according to what the argument is telling us, if there were two, any two separate things, there must be entailed in that an infinity of other things, each of which is a separator uh, between the other things which are all entailed by the, just the fact of these two existing, which is a very strange uh, thing at least even if we don't have an argument here that it's logically impossible. Uh, that'll leave you to consider whether an argument for premise 9 could be constructed, right? Um, but definitely it requires an argument. Therefore, A and B are not separated by something, right? So if premise 9 is the case, and this infinite series of, of things in that way is impossible, infinite, A and B are not separated by something. So therefore... There is only one thing. Yeah? Okay, so here's the argument. It's a strange idea, and it's a difficult argument, and I tried to make it as clear as possible. Um, and again, you know, I think you guys know how this works. You look at each premise, and then the premises in bold are the, inf the, the conclusions that are inferred by the other premises, right? So from 1 and 3, we get 4, and from 5, 6, and 7, we get Eight. Sorry, there's an extra comma in there. Doesn't look very good. Uh, but in any case, uh, I think this can sort of help you to see the line of reasoning that leads there. Okay. 
But if we wanted to sum it up, we could just say that, right, um, if there are more than one things, right, then there must be a separator, right? For any two things which are not distinct, they must be separated by something. That means there must be a thing which is a separator. And you can see here that this third premise is the key, right? Because, you know, he's saying that if they are separated by nothing, right, if there is not something which they're separated by, then they're separated by nothing, which means that they're actually not separated. And that follows from his idea here that nothing is not a thing, right? If, if nothing could be that which separates the two A and B so that they actually are separate because of this nothing which separates them, then actually we would be treating nothing as a something, something that separates, right? If nothing separates, then there's no separation, right? If, if there's a separation, then something separates. And if we want to call that nothing, well, it, it's still really something we're thinking about because nothing is not something, right? And so nothing can't do things like separate, yeah. Um, there's that argument, okay. Um, so let me stop there. Maybe it, maybe it's a good place to stop and take a pause, and you can think about it. And if you have some questions or discussion, it's a good time maybe to 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 discuss it. If there's something here you don't get, now of course remember you may not agree with the argument. That doesn't mean you don't understand it. So uh, first ask yourself ask yourself whether you understand the argument. Um, and then um, whether you agree with it as the second uh, second step, right? Because if you don't if you don't agree with it, then you need to understand why you don't agree with it. Right? You need to think about what's wrong with it. Mm -hmm. So first step is: Do we understand the argument or the two arguments here? Anyone has a question? You can just turn on your microphone and 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 speak it out okay um professor yeah do you hear me i hear you yeah um uh, i'm so confused and my brain is damaged well i mean i'm not a doctor <laughs> but uh, professor, tell, I'm tell serious. Me, ask, ask can you question. please ex explain it again okay um, well, should we go from the, well, we'll go step by step and you tell me where you get lost, right? Yeah, so, um, so what, what he's trying to say that nothing is separate and everything is connected? No, he's actually saying that there's only one thing. So everything is a one thing? Yeah, nah, there's not really many things actually to be connected. There's just only one thing, right? I mean, if there were many, so so let's go through it. You see the first premise, if there were two things, A and B, right? Then A must be separate from B. Does that make sense to you? Mm. I mean, they must be they must be different in some way, right? Or they wouldn't be two. There would just be one of them. Am I right? Or is Parmenides right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So then, yeah. so then in the second premise, he tells us A and B are either separated by nothing or by something. Is that okay? Um, so they're separate or not? Well, if they are separated, right? They are okay. separated by nothing or by something. I mean, he was he's of course going to tell us in the end that they're not separated. Okay, so maybe this okay. is the difficulty you're having because uh, this is not just a list of propositions, right? It's an argument, and this particular argument, well, this, like, a lot of philosophical arguments are like this. It's called the reductio ad absurdum, right? So it starts out, it starts out assuming something, right, with the hy hy hypothetically, and then it uh, from that infers that some absurd thing follows from what's assumed, and so that thing that is assumed must be impossible, right? Yeah, that's why it starts here with an if. If there are two things, right, then A must be separate from B. He's not saying there are two things. He's saying let's think about what would be the case if there were two things, then they must be separate, right? 
And then in the second premise, they, he's saying they would have to either be separated by nothing or by something. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're getting some kind of echo in the sound or something. Maybe everybody turn off your microphone except for Hissa. How's that? Just to make... There we go. I think everybody's microphone is off except for Hissa. So... Maybe I need to back up. Okay, here we go. This is my fault. There we go. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Mm, I'm having a. I'm making a problem with my microphone here. So, what I'll do is I'll mute myself. And I've muted myself. Hissa. All right. So no more noise from me. Oops. All right, you can hear me okay? Yeah. All right, maybe I'll just have to put up with that for a minute. Uh, right now we're, we're looking at this, your, your question. This is the key premise, right? They're, se they're separated by nothing or by something. You can understand that? Mm. Okay, just imagine the thing one and thing two in the Dr. Seuss book. How, how come book? they're separate, separated if, if it's a one thing? He's, 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 not, he's, he's assuming, for the sake of argument, that they're separated. If okay. there are, he's assuming that there are two. Okay, so let's go back in the beginning again. Look at one. If. You see where it says if? Right? If yeah. there are two things, A and B, then A must be separated from B. He's not... He doesn't think that there are two things, but he is saying that if there are two, then then the one must be separate from the other. And you're asking, oh, so you're, you're asking why you think the first premise is true. Why should we think the first premise is true? Is that right? Okay, well, let, that's, that's how, how, can, how can A and B be two things if they're not different from each other in any way? Doesn't it make sense that if there are two, then one must be somehow different from the other? Yeah. Right? I mean, so, okay, like, go back then into the uh, Dr. Seuss book. Imagine the Dr. Seuss book. I don't know. Did you ever read that book? There was Thing 1 and Thing 2? That was Cat in the Hat, right? If you read Dr. Seuss, it's very good to be, to, to be a philosopher if you read Dr. Seuss. <laughs> okay. But say like oh, there, we, 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 no. <laughs> but in any case, there, there in the cat in the hat. There's that. There's thing one and thing two. A little creature, he comes in, a little fuzzy creature, and then another little fuzzy creature, and they both look exactly the same, except for one has one on his belly and one has two on his belly, right? And that's why he's called thing one and thing two. But if it's the case that only one creature came in, one little fuzzy creature comes in. And then Dr. Seuss writes, here's thing one, and here's thing two, right? And you just see one fuzzy little creature, then you're going to say, well, well, thing one and thing two are, are not two different things. They're just one. There's, there, you know, there's only one thing there, not two things. If you were to say to Dr. Seuss, wait, in the picture, you should draw two things so that the kids can see that there are two things instead of one. Well... Those two things are going to have to be different in some way, right? One's going to have to be on the left and the other's going to be on the right, yeah? And that's how he did it. One's got one on his belly and the other's got two on his belly. So that's what the premise, the premise one is just saying that. If there are actually two things in the room, then one must be different from the other in some way, right? Yeah. And that's okay. why he's saying that they must be separate, yeah? They must be separate. Yeah. Okay, so then the question is that the second one is saying they have to be separated by something or by nothing, right? Either there's something which makes one different from the other or nothing which makes one different from the other, yeah? Yeah. If there is something that makes the one different from the other, then that would be a third thing. 
Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's say that we get thing one and thing two, and the only difference between them is one's on the left and the other's on the right. That means that there must exist a difference between left and right, right? Or the one has one on his belly, the other has two on his belly. Or maybe one has one on his belly, the other has nothing on his belly. That means that this one mark also has to be there. So now there's a third thing, yeah? But if the one mark that's on the belly of the thing is different from the thing that that, that it's on and different from the other thing, then it's either different because of something or because of nothing. See, so it goes on and on and, right? I'm just trying to put it in these concrete terms. I don't know if it helps to think about these yeah, fuzzy little creatures. Okay, so so that really means that the post, to postulate two things entails the postulation of an infinite regress or infinite series of things or, or each one you know you know each difference <clears throat> entails the existence of more things the things which are the differentiators or we can call them the separators right because those things have to be existing things right they can't you know one thing can't be separated from another by nothing because nothing if they're separated by nothing that means nothing separates them they're not separate so they're not different Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, now I'm explaining the premise. Whenever you explain a premise, I mean, you sort of have to argue in favor of making it, you know, make it seem plausible. Right? Uh, but that doesn't mean that, 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 it's all, that it's all correct, right? I mean, I mean, obviously, if you think there's more than one thing, then there's something wrong with this argument. <laughs> right? And I haven't met many people who actually believe that there is, a, you know, some that there's, a, that there's only one thing. But in the history of philosophy, this sense of somehow the 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 illusion of the the sort of illusory, right? Illusory means you know being an illusion. Yeah, the illusory nature of multiplicity and plurality it's, it's, a, it's a pretty strong intuition and it recurs in the history of philosophy over and over again even till today because uh, this is a compelling argument yeah is it uh, related to the Tao? I mean yeah I think that you could probably I mean it's plausible that Taoism is also motivated by similar insight yeah mm -hmm. yeah but the Taoism, I mean, Taoism, I mean, if you read Tao Te Ching, it does refer to the 10,000 things and so forth, right? So multiplicity is there and unity is there in the background. And of course, the whole question is, you know, the relation between those. You know, I mean, I don't see, I didn't really see any clear argument about how those are related in, in, Tao, in, in the Tao Te Ching. But I don't think Taoists, um, I, think, I don't think they're really motivated to, um, figure it out in, in the same sense that, you know, maybe Parmenides was. Yeah. Uh, so there you go. But yeah, you're onto something. The fact that you kind of have read Taoism and that this sort of, let's say, resonated with your, what you remembered from that reading, that means you have an, uh, kind of some idea about what Parmenides is saying here. Yeah. Uh, why he's saying what he's saying. All right, so we go on, I guess, to uh, uh, the Zeno. Zeno is, an, you know, uh, an advocate of Parmenides' philosophy. Yeah. He also believes that plurality in the world and change in the world is an illusion, something which we experience but somehow is not real, right? And that everything is one and it doesn't change. Right. So he has an argument here that change is impossible. He made a lot of arguments to support Parmenides. And we're just going to talk about one of them. Right? He uses, and he's an example, an archer. So there's now, again, a lot of steps in this argument. So you can take this and, and sort of read it or look at it. And it's there for you later if you want to look at it. Post it on the Blackboard page. I'm just going to describe it, you know, uh, and, and as it comes naturally to me here. So imagine that somebody now uh, is going to shoot an arrow at a target, right? 
um, that means that the arrow moving from the place, the point in space where the person is shooting it from to the target is a change, right? That's movement, right, over a distance in space. And so that's a kind of change. The, you know, it's, it's the most common kind of change probably for us to experience things moving around, around in the world. So we'll take that kind of change as the example. And well, here's an example. The arrow flies, it's supposed to fly and hit the target, right? Now, the argument is this, right? Zeno says if the arrow is going to reach the target and if a change actually occurs, it has to travel across some distance. It has to move from point A to point B, right? Because if you shoot the arrow and the arrow ends up in the same place that it started from and didn't go to any different place in between, right? then that means no movement happened and no change occurred. So there must be a change in the position of the arrow. Well, that's in this case how we experience it. It's the change from it being in the bow to be it being far away in the target, you know, at the bullseye if the guy hit it right. So there's some distance that it has to travel across to get from point A to point B. And you know, you know, so let's put it that way. If there was no distance between point A and point B, then going from, then point A and point B would be the same point, right? And moving from one to the other wouldn't be a change. It wouldn't be a movement at all. It'd be just standing still. So it has to go across this distance to get from A to B. That distance has to be there in order for, it, for there to be any movement. But, but, but any distance can be divided by half, Parmenides says. You see that in the third premise there. Right? So that means that before the arrow can travel from point A to point B, it has to travel through this halfway point, right in between, which we could call C, point C, right? The midway point between A and B, right? And so let's say that it does, it gets to the C, right? But in order for it to get to C, to point C, right, it also has to reach the midway point between A, the beginning, right, and C, the original midway point, right? And we can call that point D, yeah? And you see where this is going, right? Because in order to reach point D, right, well, in A and D, that new midway point, right, I guess that would be the one quarter way or something, then there would have to be, uh, you know, another midway. Well, there has to be a distance between the two, again, otherwise at the same point, any distance can be divided in half, which means that there's another midway point, point E, that the arrow has to travel through in order to get to point D. And it goes on and on and on. Each time, if, there are, if there's any change, there must be two different points in space, and the arrow goes from one to the other different one. That difference meaning there has to be a distance between them, and the fact that any distance can be divided means that there have to be more points that the arrow has to pass before it reaches any of the other points. So the upshot is that before the arrow can go from traveling from one place in space to any other place, it has to pass through an infinite number of places before it reaches that. And nothing can travel for an infinite you know, distance. So therefore, everything just doesn't really move. I mean, it's logically impossible for anything to get anywhere, right? Um, because before it could get anywhere, it has to get halfway between where it's at and that place. And there's always another halfway to get to, <laughs> right? There's another halfway or another distance to travel between any, right? Between any point. So the arrow will never be able to reach its target, right? And by extension, Logically speaking, uh, nothing actually can move from one point to another, right? Um, according to at least what it appears to be, what, what reason appears to show us. Even though our senses show us things moving around and, you know, if you witness somebody shooting an arrow and it hitting the target, yeah, it cannot really be the case that that same arrow has traveled across, you know? To reach the target that's the argument um how is that can everybody understand what's going on there
Okay. Um, maybe we can go on to consider it further by imagining some objections. So we have a number of premises here and a conclusion. That's quite a list. Probably be easier to have, a, you know, if you have this sort of as a hard copy or something to refer back to. But I'll just keep flipping back and forth. So we'll go to the next slide and where we're going to discuss some of the objections, right? So, yeah, why? Why is this the case? What's the problem here? Well, we might think that the central premise is the third premise. Any distance can be divided in half, right? So you see that was there. Any distance can be divided in half. That's one of the key premises, right? Because the idea here is to move from one place to another. The two places must be different. And for them to be different, there must be a distance between them. And then up, any distance can be divided, right? Which means that there are other places to pass through before you can cross the distance. Yeah. Um, maybe not any distance. Not, maybe it's not the case that every distance can be divided in half. Maybe there are distances that are so small that you can cross those distances without having to pass through any places or points in between. So if that's the case, the arrow could get to the target because it would just have to pass each of those very, very tiny distance, you know, one by one, and they could accumulate, right? Uh, instead of, you know, without having to pass between, you know, all of the supposed halfway points, okay? So, is there a distance so short that it cannot be divided? That would be the question. And that raises the second question. If there was a distance so short it cannot be divided, then how long is that distance, right? Well, it, it seems like such a distance could not have any length, right? Because if it had any length at all, it's hard to see how someone can maintain the proposition that you can't divide it, right? So we would have to say it has zero length, yeah? And we can call that a zeron, maybe. A distance with no length, right? And then we have, like, you know, only a finite number of zerons in between point A and point B. So therefore, a thing can travel from point A to point B because it just has to pass through a finite number of zerons, right? And the reason that there are a finite number of these zerons is because each one of them is no length, right, indivisible, yeah. So we can take that backwards, right, and we'll say for the arrow to travel exactly one zeron from the bow, right, it doesn't need to reach any halfway mark because one zeron cannot be divided in half since it has no length. So then what about two zerons, right? Supposedly, if it passes through the first zeron, then it can pass through the next zeron and the next zeron after that until it reaches the target. But how long is two zerons, right? Well, it seems like it has to be zero, right? Because each of them has no length, and so if you add nothing to nothing, right, you still get nothing, right? So how many zerons is the distance between the bow and the target? Well, there you go. How many zerons does it take? How many sort of, you know, um, zero length units can you, do you need to reach from point A to point B? And can you say that it's an infinity or is it even meaningful? So it seems like we end up with the same situation, right? If, if, if there were indivisible units of distance, right, uh, then motion would still be impossible because right? Uh, no matter how many of those you line up, you don't get anything more than zero because zero times anything is still zero, right? Yeah. All right, that's basically our end of our section on Parmenides, and we bring Zeno in because Zeno's a, one of the famous early proponents of Parmenides and Parmenidean philosophy. And that, 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 there it is. We have something kind of very surprising kind of philosophy, which um, musters what seem to be pretty logical, reasonable arguments uh, for the conclusion that there's only one thing and that, it, and that it never changes because of the fact that 
the concept of more than one thing and the concept of change is entailing a logical contradiction and is therefore impossible. Mm -hmm. um, this is a strange view, but we'll see that even though the later views of the later pre-Socratic philosophers that we're going to talk about do not subscribe to Parmenides' conclusion, they take this problem very seriously and it really shapes, um, right? Uh, this problem really shapes uh, many of the future, you know, uh, ways of understanding uh, phenomena and the world around us. Yeah. You'll see when we get there, especially when we talk about the atomists and so forth. It'll be really interesting. <laughs>